Hi friends, this episode of Big Blue Banter is brought to you by Prize Picks. Head on over to Prize Picks and use promo code BANTER and they'll match up to $100 on a new deposit. Thank you and enjoy. Welcome back. It's the Big Blue Banter, New York Giants football podcast. I'm Dan Schneier. Joined as always my co-host Nick Filato. We are through the first couple waves of free agency. Obviously still a little bit more to come. The Giants recently re-signed. That's today. Darnay Holmes recording two podcasts today. And they're bringing in Tredavious White for a visit later this week. He may come in. Obviously, Joe Shane has connections to Tredavious White from his time in Buffalo. So going to be some signings. But for the most part, they've done what they wanted to do in free agency. So with that said, we're going to turn it over. Look today at the five biggest needs for the New York Giants heading into the draft. Now, let me make it clear and set some ground rules for this. One, these are long-term needs and short-term needs, but we will focus on the long-term as well. We're not just going to look at it like just what they need for 2024. Two, just because something's ranked number one on our needs list or number three on our needs list or number five on our needs list doesn't mean you just look at a draft and say, I want position that's ranked number one on the leads list, needs list in the first round. I want position that's ranked number two on the needs list in the second round. I want position that's ranked number three on the needs list in the third round. That's not how drafts work. That's not how roster building works. That's how only a bad, horrific team that will be destined to be in the bottom barrel of their division every single year would operate. You cannot draft because of need. That is how every bad team loses. That's how all the stupid teams end up bad. That's what, that's how we ended up using dumping an early third round supplemental draft pick on Sam Beal. That's how you make these mistakes that you don't want to repeat. And for the Giants case, it would be repeating in some, in some ways. So let's make it clear now the ground rules of this thing. If a position is ranked number one as a need, it doesn't mean the Giants should take them. What you have to do in the draft is, for the most part, this is what Joe Shane does, by the way. You draft best player available, but you make sure that's at a position of value. So you're not saying it's just a running back or a fullback or a linebacker. It's a position that gets paid in the NFL, wide receiver, corner, edge rusher, quarterback. Those are the positions of value, those four mostly. Um, and offensive tackle, you can throw in there five, those five. And now these days, guard too is getting paid a lot. So let's put six in there. Guard is now a position of value. I don't know if Shane views it that way, Nick. That's another discussion for another day, but let's put it in there for now, those six positions. So you look at position value and you try to match need with value. That's the perfect pick. When GMs get to do that, Nick, that's great. Like the Giants are sitting at six. They really need a wide receiver one. If Leak Neighbors is on the board, that could be a perfect pick in their mind. They're matching need with value. They really need another position that could be a perfect pick as well. So just keep these ground rules in mind. Anything else I missed from a ground rule standpoint before we get going? Because there's a lot of misinterpretation in these types of pods. No, I think we're good to go and roll into it. This is a fun exercise. The Giants, yeah. look, if a really good linebacker is around and it's just like a you know adequate guard, I'm not. we're not going to advocate that you go for the guard or what, right. what have you. It's a fun exercise. Yeah, just have fun with it. So we're going to go five to one. The fifth biggest need position for the Giants heading into the NFL draft is the offensive guard position still. And I understand that the New York Giants, they've invested in the offensive line, right? You add Aaron Stinney, Austin Schlotman, who's more of a center, John Runyon to your offensive line. You have Jalen Mayfield, Marcus McKeithen, and Joshua Zudu still there who, you know, Zudu and McKeithen, they, they haven't really been healthy, right? So we don't really know what you have with them. You have Jermaine Illuminor who can play guard as well. I'm still an advocate, and we will always be advocates on this podcast to invest in the interior offensive line. You need to find your best combination of five guys that you can field out there. And if there is a player who can come in here and who can compete to be a backup swing guard, we know how many injuries the Giants have had over the years on the offensive line. I'm going to want the Giants to invest in that. Now, Dan and I went back and forth before this podcast as we were coming up with this list. I think Edge can seriously be considered still, even though the Giants – <laughs> have invested in Brian Burns and Kayvon Thibodeau, but you have Aziz Ojolari as your third. I'm comfortable with that. But if Burns or Thibodeau get hurt, I don't know if I'm as comfortable with Aziz Ojolari in that full-time starting role. He has not proven to be healthy. And you have Boogie Basham, Benton Whitley, and and who? Uh, Timon Fox as your other edge rushers. I think some of those guys are expendable on the back end of your roster, and you can invest and add an edge, and that can help complement your overall pass rush. I think that could have been five. I'm honestly okay with linebacker being five, but ultimately investing in that offensive line to assist the run game and the quarterback in pass protection is more important right now, given the overall roster. Yeah, it was a tough debate for what would be number five. I think the first four are very clear to us, the first four needs that we're about to go over, but fifth was tough. And I think what it comes down to is for Nick and I, we really believe in investing in the offensive line, building through the trenches and adding depth and competition on the offensive line. And I'm not so sure outside of John Runyon that there really is a guaranteed 
future piece right now on the interior. Obviously, John Smith. We're just going to say John Michael Smith. We're going to say a guard. I'm not so sure there's a second guard that's a lock to be a part of the future. Azudu could be, maybe, Nick, if he develops and if he's okay from an injury standpoint. Neil, maybe, if they convert him to guard. And then the other side would be that, and then they move Illuminor to tackle. And then Illuminor, maybe, if they leave Neil at right tackle and he finally figures it out and they believe Illuminor. But I'm not so positive that like Illuminor is viewed as a long-term fixture at, at guard. And I don't not so positive Evan Neal is viewed as a long-term picture at guard. I think there's a chance that both of those could not be. So with that in mind, and obviously the Azudu, uh, you know, where he's at with his development, guard is an important position, especially when we understand how important winning in the trenches is in and how important the offensive line is, especially with the direction the Giants seem to be going at running back, not prioritizing paying one back, instead looking to build an offensive line and looking to improve your run game by building your offensive line, like all the best teams tend to do. So with that said, I'm okay putting guard all the way up at five ahead of some of those positions. Edge, they can use some depth, obviously. Tackle, I still think, is a position for me that was coming to mind because I'm not so positive that Neil or Illuminor is a long-term solution at right tackle. They may be, but I'm not positive on either of those fronts. And then, obviously, you know, linebacker, as you mentioned, we could still use some depth there. And we don't know for sure that the progress made. I'm pretty confident that Bobby Okereke will fit in Shane Bowen's defense, but I'm not positive Micah McFadden will fit in this defense. We'll have to see. I'm hopeful. He looked really good on film last year for the most part. He had a little bit of a lull, but uh, you know, he had a stretch where he looked really good, Micah McFadden. So I'm hopeful there, but I'm not positive. It's a new system for him, and it may not fit his specific skill set. Skill set. Yeah, linebacker and then interior defensive line oh, yeah, slash it's another one. edge. Th those are those are the two positions that I'm like you can easily if you say that's your fifth, cool. Yes. Like I completely get it. Like I would have liked to add uh, Danico Waltry, who's no longer on the market, who had a lot of familiarity with Shane Bowen's system, specifically a 290 pounder who is they flexible still might, enough. Did he sign anywhere? Yeah. Oh, he did. Yeah, he, that. yeah, no, yeah, he did sign somewhere, but he's no longer on the market. But in the draft, possibly, you invest in like a bigger body defensive end who can kick inside sometimes. The Giants don't necessarily have that. You can argue Ryder sure. Anderson, but are you really putting a lot of chips in the Ryder Anderson mm. basket right now? Not no. so certain. Everybody else is bigger. DJ Davidson, Jordan Riley, Dexter Lawrence, Raheem Nunez Roaches. Those guys are all bigger interior defensive linemen. We don't have the more Jihad Ward types of defensive linemen edge rushers. And I would like to add a player like that who is – pretty good at football though that 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 would be a that's another investment that i would be certainly okay with yep how about number four for you and for us nick we're, we have the same list here so what do we got for number four is the giants fourth biggest need heading into the draft it's got to be safety man and it, the only reason it's it's not higher is because the other three needs that we have are of higher priority but if you look at if you look at the safety position you have jalen mills who you brought in he could start for you he played about 500 snaps last year kind of a like okay like he's solid in run support he's not going to be very rangy he's not overly fluid been around the league for a while but not somebody who's inspiring and certainly somebody that you would like to improve upon if he was a starter in your defense i like jason pinnock as a starter i think jason pinnock you can yes plug him in ideally you want dane belton to take Jalen Mills' role if Jalen Mills is the starter i'm not certain if Jay, uh, dane belton is there i think dane belton from a processing standpoint wildly smart he reads the route combinations. He's very instinctive in coverage. He has the range and the fluidity to play the post, play single high safety. Mm -hmm. But he's not that great run support. Yeah. And, there's, and, and that that was a problem. Why he didn't see the field all that often. Wink Martin he doesn't take great field. angles either. Doesn't take great angles coming downhill. At Iowa, he operated in the slot. He operated, he operated all over the back end, but he operated in the slot and in the box a little bit. So he can be physical, but judging and framing his his tackle points. Those are all issues, man. And he's a little bit wild when he's going to to make those tackles. So so that's one reason why I'm a little uh, hesitant to to say the safety position is is secure from a starting standpoint because Jalen Mills and Dane Belton. I would love Dane Belton to seize that opportunity. Not certain it's going to happen. And then you just have Javarius Owens. So you're looking at the safety room and you're like, I don't know what you can expect from Javarius Owens at all right now, Dan. Right. So that's certainly a need that I, I would like the Giants, especially if Shane Bowen's going to use as many three safety packages yes. like he did in Tennessee. You, you need to add another body to that room. Yeah, I was going to say the reason it's up there for me all the way up at four is because of what you just said, that Shane Bowen's going to use a lot of three safety packages. He did it in Tennessee. He's going to do it here. And if you use three safety packages, you need more safeties that are capable on the field. Right now, I feel confident in, in Jason Pinnock, and that's about it. I like Dane Belton, and I liked him as a potential sleeper going into last year. And maybe a new coaching staff can really be a good thing for him, and I still think it's possible. But I'm not ready to count on him just yet. The reason it's not even higher, I guess, than for us at four, based on what I just evaluated to start, would be that 
I just don't view it as a very position of value, a, view, as a position you should be investing crazy assets into, which is why I'm going to say, Nick, despite me having it all the way up to four, I personally won't be too thrilled if one of the first two picks, obviously it won't be the first pick. There's no safety like that in the class. But if they use 47 at safety, it's not personally for me. Um, I just am not a big fan of using a top 50 pick at safety unless it's Antoine Winfield Jr., who I love coming out of college and to me was just such a surefire prospect. Like, I need that. I need, like, Ky Kyle Hamilton. I need Antoine Winfield Jr. See, if I want to go that route. Brian Branch. What if Brian Branch? And Branch. That's another round. one. I need okay. that. And that's a first-round pick. Well, well, when did Branch go? He went in the second he round? He was second round. He was second sure. round. Sure. So I shouldn't say I don't definitely. I shouldn't. You're right, then. I really shouldn't rule out safety at 47 if there is one of those types in this class. But I have to look at the class a little bit more to see if that's possible. But to me, it would. Yeah, go ahead. I've dug into the safety position a little bit more than other positions. And there isn't one unless you consider Koopa DeGene as somebody who you want oh, to I plug think, in at number oh, two. With the depth of this class, fluid and rangy and long enough to play cornerback. He's a wildly good tackler in space and coming down in the box. You can really just use him however you want to use him. A lot of people have, have kind of uh, comped him to a Jalen Ramsey. So if he has a Jalen Ramsey type skill set, Jalen Ramsey, we all think of him as a cornerback, but he's been used mm -hmm. as a safety. He's been used in the yeah. slides, he's been used in the box. He's been used everywhere. So that's kind of what Cooper DeGene is. And that would be, I think, the only safety that a lot of Giant fans would be, or defensive back that Giant fans would look at and be like, oh, 47, that's fine. He's going to be off the board by then, though. Yeah, given the work you've done already on the class, Nick, I would say that I would then basically probably not be that interested in us going safety at 47. I think in general, it's just a risky position to use a, a premium capital on personally. Like a lot of busts at the position, a lot of skinny-ish guys that get injured a lot. It's just not typically for me. If I see a surefire eval, Brian Branch, we loved his eval. We did an eval on him last year, loved him. Loved Kyle Hamilton eval, loved Antoine Winfield Jr. eval. Those to me, at the time I loved them, during the process, and then after – that I'm okay with, but it has to be that for me. It has to be like that surefire type prospect that could go in round one, but he's lasting to round two because nobody wants to draft safeties high. Basically, that type of player. And that's what all three of those were. Kyle Hamilton ended up going in round one, but he went like 13 picks later than he probably should have based on his film because he plays safety. So if you get that, yes. But outside of that, I'm not into it really. And I've made mistakes in the past. Like Ashton Davis was a guy whose tape I loved at Cal and he's just sucked with the jets and he's small and he gets injured a lot. Like is he skinny? He gets in like, it's just a position that gets hurt a lot. So I would rather, especially right now, given the, the, the needs we're going to go over, I'd rather invest it somewhere else. So that's kind of where I'm at on safety. I would say it's the fourth biggest need and it's a bigger need than maybe the prior a position of priority for Joe Shane. Now let's move on to the third, which is very close to safety. And I think it's a, a huge need for this yes. team. And it's something that they're going to invest in. And Cooper DeGene actually falls into this as well, as we were just discussing. And that is the cornerback position. I think, man, when you look at this, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because the Giants have had some good cornerbacks in recent memory. James Bradbury, when he was on the Giants, was a good cornerback. Dory Jackson was a very underrated cornerback. Dory Jackson is no longer here. James Bradbury is cooked and no longer here. And you spent a first-round pick on Deontay Banks last season. So Deontay Banks is still on your roster. Who is starting opposite of Deontay Banks right now? Maybe Nick McLeod. Yeah. Maybe Nick Trey McLeod. Hawkins. Trey Hawkins. Are you going to bring Jalen Mills out and kick him out to outside cornerback? I mean, like Nick McLeod, they didn't even trust to put on the field last year. We like his tape more than than they do, but or apparently, or at least the fast coaching staff. It Trey could just Hawkins be because he's such a like a key special teamer that they view sure, him they more like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe that that's why I, I liked Nick McLeod's tape. Um, I don't necessarily want him to be a starter, though. Like he's like that third cornerback that you bring in is like, oh, Nick McLeod's out there. 44 making plays. You look at this, man. There's not a lot of depth here. Cordell. Flott. Add, yeah. Cordell Flott obviously is not player. feeling good about any of those three. Really? I mean, I and like then, McLeod, and then there's not the the elephant in the room. I'm not sure if if uh, if you want to call him that because he's not an elf. He's more like an ant in the room, and that's Aaron Robinson because everyone forgets about him. Oh, yeah. But what are you expecting out of Aaron Robinson? It, my, my, my point is, man, if you don't invest in cornerback, and I don't know if it's going to be at 47. I don't know if it's going to be in a trade-down situation. It might be on day three. But if you don't, you're relying – on Nick McLeod, Cordell Flott, or Aaron Robinson to seize that starting cornerback spot. Or maybe Jalen Mills, if you're going to bring him down. But then you're like really thin at safety. So you can kind of create this competitive atmosphere and let the cream rise to the top. Trey Hawkins the third, you can throw him in there. But none yeah. of those names I just listed are guys that you want starting opposite of C.D. Lamb and A.J. Brown and Devonta Smith and, yeah. and Terry McLaurin and Jahan uh, Dotson. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I, I watched... 
I watched Trey Hawkins try to match up and press man against Tyreek Hill on a third down and just get absolutely cooked. And it's like, well, is this ever going to change or is this physically who he is? And he doesn't. And most likely it's just that he doesn't really have the speed to play outside corner at the NFL level. He's a six round draft pick. I know he had an amazing training camp, but that's why we can't continue to overstate training camp when it's mostly padless practices, when it's going against your own team, controlled setting, all the things that lead to us seeing things like Daniel Jones is unreal in training camp. He's about to become a top five quarterback. And obviously everything else that we saw in training camp last year from all the hype. And we've learned from that, Nick. And I think every fan has at this point understood that, you know, don't make too much of training camp. It's kind of like spring training in baseball. Let's not make too much of spring training stats, but you know, I don't feel comfortable with Trey Hawkins. I don't feel comfortable with any of those corners right now on the outside. And I'll be honest with you, Nick, part of me thinks, okay, I'm okay putting this at three instead of two and one because two and one, the positions are such big needs, I think, for the Giants, and we both think, and they're such positions of value and importance and changing games that I'm okay with this. And that, you know, to, to, you know, add context to that, Nick, I would say this, the fact that the Giants have invested so much now with this Brian Burns trade in the defensive line and their pass rush leads me to believe that they're going in direction of pass rush over pass coverage. I'm fine. That's good. Trench play. I've started to come around to it. And if that's the case, maybe you can deprioritize a position like corner and safety because you're hoping that your defensive line gets the job done so often that you don't need to rely as much on having great corners and great safeties. And they have one corner who we really like on this roster anyway, and Deontay Banks. Part of me thinks that. The other part of me thinks, oh, God, can I really uh, have Trey Hawkins out there on the outside on third down or Cordell Flott or Nick McLeod and, and feel good and comfortable about it? Probably not. So this is a major need. This is a position I think I could easily see them taking either in round one if they trade down from six with the Vikings, they get a godfather offer to get 11, 23, and maybe a future second. That could be a pick I see them going 11 or 23. Or it could be a pick when you're sitting on the board at 47, Nick, or in the third round, 70, I believe is that pick, but it might be off on that, where you, you look at it and you say, our, our, our need right now meets the value. The best player on our board is also a corner. We take a corner. So I think corner is very much in play for the Giants in round two and three. And one, if they trade down, but not at six, I don't think they're taking a corner. No, now the trade down could be interesting, but Terry and Arnold from Alabama, Nate Wiggins Great from play. Clemson, Cooper DeGene, Iowa, and Kenyon Mitchell from Toledo. They're not going to be there at 47, more than likely. No. So we're talking about the, what, the Kool-Aid McKistry from Alabama. We're talking about TJ Tampa from Iowa State. We're talking about players like that. And that's mm -hmm. a, that is, a, in my opinion, from what I understand, from what I have seen, it's a big step down from those top players because those top players i don't know if they're as good as deontay banks last year like i loved witherspoon i loved banks i liked mm -hmm. gonzalez a lot like gonzalez was also a stud and i think i'm forgetting another cornerback that we really liked in hyper it was it was the guy who went to see it was uh porter right or no you didn't love porter. no i didn't i didn't really like porter that much there was a but regard or no the, the emmanuel forbes who did oh, not forbes. have a great forbes. rookie season i liked forbes's tape he was a ball hog he's just 160 pounds and it does not seem like it's going to work out all that well at least it didn't in a year new one system and, could help him though potentially yeah. a new system could help him that that is true but my point is the tj tampa's in the down you know you start getting to Kyrie jackson from or yeah i don't i don't know if they're necessarily on that level now, right. Kyrie Jackson, I have watched. I did not see him as as quite, not even close to like a Deontay Banks. Okay. I still need to watch some of these other players. So, but you need to add somebody. You need to find that guy to, to bring in and compete. In an ideal world, though, Cordo Flott has flashed. He flashed a little bit his rookie season, just a little bit, a smidge. And then last year, he had some plays. And then there were also plays that were frustrating where he was not staying in phase and he was overly aggressive and he wasn't necessarily, I feel like his judgment on a certain like crossing routes where he, like the wide receiver would flatten and he wouldn't flatten or it would take him like an extra half second to flatten. Yep. And then he would take this looping arc and then really have to adjust himself. And it was a double move. He would have been absolutely screwed to change direction like that. All of that can be correctable. I think he has the traits. And one thing about Cordell Flott that, uh, that, I don't want to forget is he was drafted at like 20 years old, right? Mm -hmm. He was another one like Emmanuel Forbes, who was like 170 pounds when he was drafted. He was a very small guy. So hopefully he can grow into it. He's still a very young player, but again, man, I think you need to add the competition and the depth to this roster or else your secondary. There's no strong, like real safety option there. There's no right. cornerback other than banks. That's holding it down. You're going to be in dime. You're going to be in dollar. You're going to be in quarter and you're going to have, Trey Hawkins, a third out there, Javarius, like if injuries happen, you know, so it's definitely something they need to uh, invest in. 
Yeah, it's a it's a it's a massive need for the Giants right now, and I'm sure that they're looking in the free agent market as well as we head into the draft next. So this could be yeah. dated if they sign a Tre'Davious White potentially, and that could alter their plans. Are they home, baby? <laughs> homes resign but this could be definitely a position where we see the giants either via trade back or you know i think more likely would in that scenario nick they might find somebody in round three that they like another one of those developmental picks like a flot and i'm not ready to give up on flot yet i still no, I, no, no, I like no. this tape enough and i like this projection enough that i'm just willing to say that you know sometimes players like this and we knew going in he was a incredibly young prospect an incredibly raw prospect like we knew that it was going to take time so now we can't look at it now and be like well, what happened he's not there yet after year two we knew it was going to take time this wasn't a ready-made prospect um and he's had injuries too by the way so i I'm would say a dory jackson that. you bring a dory jackson back but he just said that uh he's um wants to compete for a super bowl and i was like ah oh. i don't think he's coming here then if that's oh. the case <laughs> uh not yet at least um not yet What's going on, Big Blue Banter listeners? I'm excited for the football season for several reasons. And one of those reasons is Prize Picks, which is North America's largest independently owned daily fantasy sports platform. And it's so simple to use. Instead of battling thousands of other players, including professionals, sharks, and people who are going to exploit you, you pick more than or less than on two to six player stat projections, and you just watch the winnings roll in. It's very simple to play and gives you a little extra skin. I've set my picks in less than 60 seconds. There are so many stats to choose from, and the withdrawals of funds are easy and quick. Dan and I will be adding a segment to our show before every game where we pick our favorite stats, more or less, yards or touchdowns, what have you, and we'll be discussing why from a scheme, matchup, and game theory perspective. I love their promotions and how easy their interface is to operate at prize picks. I may select more on tackles for a loss from Bobby Okereke or Kayvon Thibodeau next game. They also do other sports as well. It's a really cool experience. Please join Dan and I in the fun of prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. Again, go to prizepicks.com slash banter and use code banter for a first deposit match up to $100. You will not regret it. You ever feel sluggish or out of focus? Are you stressed? Has your digestive system caused discomfort or flatulence like a certain co-host on this podcast during a live stream? If so, you should check out AG1. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my daily health. I had more energy, I was better off at the gym, and I could focus on my work in a much more efficient manner. That's because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. Not only did I replace my multivitamin with AG1, but I love that every scoop also includes prebiotics, probiotics, and digestive enzymes for gut support. I recommend AG1 to all my family and friends because AG1 has a team of doctors and scientists that formulate around the latest science and maintains high quality standards within the industry. Even my friends have started drinking AG1, and they always tell me how energetic they feel and how it's helped them out at the gym, and also it's helped them manage their stress levels. That's why we're happy to have AG1 as our partner. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3, K2, and five free AG1 travel packs when you first subscribe. Go to drinkag1.com slash banter. That's drinkag1.com slash banter to check it out. So we'll see what happens on that front. But yeah, so corners number three. Now going to number two for us. What was our second biggest need for the Giants heading into the draft? Got to get a wide receiver one. We like Wandell Robinson. We like, I say we loved Wandell Robinson, I think at this yes. point. Like I'm, I'm really interested in Wandell Robinson's career. And I think he is going to outperform the expectations that I had for him. Dumb, dumbass Nick Filato had for him when the Giants selected him. We really like Jalen Hyatt going into his second year. And then you have Darius Slayton. 
solid 11 personnel package. You need a wide receiver one. Whoever your quarterback is, if it's Daniel Jones, if it's Drew Locke, if it's a rookie quarterback, you need to find a primary receiving threat. You just lost Saquon Barkley. 26 was the face of your offense. Whether we like it or not, he was. That's the first player defensive coordinator circled going into games with Saquon Barkley. Now, who is it? Darren Waller might retire. So who, who are we really talking about? You need to get a Odunze, a Malik Neighbors, a Marvin Harrison Jr. maybe, right? So you need to find a way to land a wide receiver one. I wonder if it will. Like, I'm not necessarily advocating for them to trade for T. Higgins and give that guy a massive contract with all of his injuries, but that that is necessarily wide receiver one. I think this more so, though, pertains to the draft since the Giants are picking at six. And if they don't opt to go with our number one biggest need, then they're more than likely going to select the number two biggest need. And there are wide receivers who should be around at six, at least one of them, whether it be a Dunze or neighbors that the Giants can pounce upon. And he would be the best wide receiver, probably at least from a ceiling standpoint, the Giants have had since, as we wow. said, last podcast, Odell Beckham Jr. Yeah. You nailed it. And this is a good one for the Giants. It's a massive need. It's our second biggest need. And it's a good opportunity for the Giants because I think that both picks six and 47, there's a really good chance that value aligns perfectly with need in this case. And value being not just that wide receiver one is a position that gets paid a lot in the NFL. And Joe Shane has made it clear he's going to try to draft those positions with high assets so he doesn't, you know, so he can beat the market essentially from a cap standpoint. Think about it from this standpoint. You see Jerry Judy get this $20 million per year contract yeah, or whatever it was. If you're Joe Shane, and you say, if I could draft someone, I get them under team control. If they're a second round pick for 2 million against the cap, if they're a first round pick for 8 million against the cap, and now I got them under team control and I'm beating the market because the market is paying 20 million against their cap for guys like Jerry Judy. And I'm getting better players for 8 million against the cap or 2 million against the cap if you get a guy in round two. So I think it's a great spot for the Giants to meet value with need and best player overall, get all three knocked out at pick six or at pick 47 because this wide receiver class is so damn deep. That at 47, if you tell me, Nick, I get a Ricky Parasol, who I like, or a Lad McConkey at 47, who I really, really like. I like him even more. Hey, yeah, you're doing there, Lad. Yeah, Lad McConkey. Or, you know, there's a chance that other guys fall that are that are not expected to there. I personally like Keon Coleman a lot, and I would love to take Keon Coleman there at 47 as well. So there's a lot of players that I like at receiver that could easily be on the board at 47. There's also players I love at receiver who could be on the board at number three or uh, number six overall, Nick. I said it on Twitter the other day, and I talked about this with David Cyberson. I went back to the last 10 draft classes. I went 10 draft classes deep, Nick. I am so high on neighbors, Harrison, and Dunze, because now I've had a chance to watch all three because I finally got a chance to watch a Dunze with Penix. I'm so high on all three of those dudes, Nick. That I think that they would be, I don't think this, I know that they would be my wide, and this is before the draft. So you have to look at this, not after the fact. Before the draft, they would be my, all three of those guys would be my wide receiver one in seven of the last 10 draft classes. Seven of the last 10 draft. Now there's been some red, bad ones in there. There's been some good ones in there too. Seven of the last 10 draft classes. We have three wide receivers for me at least that would be my wide receiver one in every one in seven of those 10. So, you know, if you look at pick six. And I, and I would want you to look back and tell me what you think about yeah. that. And I'd see what you're, you're interested. I mean, the Jamar chase class, I had Jamar chase over him. There's some classes where see, that's the interesting one with the Jamar chase. Cause I wonder if they, other than Marvin Harrison jr. So just neighbors and a Dunze, I know I'm kind of putting mm -hmm. you on the spot here. Would they be in the top three of that draft class with Waddle, Devonta Smith and Jamar chase? And that's, that's no the interesting knock on one. Them. It's just yeah, all that, three of that, those that's, studs. I didn't go that deep. I just looked at like who would be my, if they would be wide receiver one in every class. So I looked at the top receiver of every class, Jamar Chase being that gotcha. that class. I would have to think about it more. I I loved Waddle's tape so much, and I love Smith's tape so much. Smith was so good, but, man. Smith I wanted to be that, a New York Giant. That's why it's so painful yeah, about that. Yeah. He was at Madison Square Garden in a Yankee yeah. hat the, the weekend before the draft. That dude wanted to be a New York Giant, and he got drafted to Philadelphia, and now he's mm -hmm. thriving, flying high. He's, God, it's gross. I think neighbors – Neighbors and Waddle are similar. Like I, I, but Waddle was so good too. I don't know. It's close with Waddle and neighbors. And then Odunze is just a different kind of prospect, but man, he yeah. checks out so much on tape for me. Like he, I'm from in what on, I've seen, bro, Adonze. you don't find many six foot it's three, feet. 219 like pound receivers who have feet like that and yeah. were as fluid. As yes. That. Yes. A lot of people are like, oh, is he Laquan Treadwell? It's like Laquan Treadwell no. has huge injury concerns coming yes. out of Ole Miss. And he was not, was not fluid. fluid. He was never really yeah. fluid. He was a it's all about athlete. when you're that big, it's all about if you're fluid. Like you ask, I remember them asking Aaron Rodgers, why did Jordy Nelson work at the NFL level? He's six foot four. He's a hulking wide receiver. It, and Aaron Rodgers said it best. He's like, watch his feet. 
watch how he runs routes, watch his feet. And it's all about the footwork for Jordy Nelson. And that was the case for Dante Adams too. Dante Adams, yeah, yeah. he was incredibly productive at Fresno State, but he didn't run a good 40. He didn't jump out the gym. He didn't do any of that stuff on, uh, you know, on the combine. He wasn't an exceptional athlete, but it's the feet, man. And it's Cooper Cup as well. It's all these like great separators. It's the feet. And I feel like Roma Dante has that. It's a couple. It's the feet primarily, but it's also how you get in and out of your breaks. Yes. How fluid are you? How can yes. you sink your hips and maintain your balance yep. and then explode out of those breaks? And with Dunze, he does that. Now, he doesn't do it necessarily. So does neighbors. No one neighbors. does. No, no, yeah, no that's one in this class does it at neighbors level. Not even Harrison Jr. does that at neighbors level. Neighbors is, is crazy with stuff like that, man. And that's why I am like, I'm going to do my evaluation on him very soon. And I'm very excited about it. He That's is fun. to me, it's just like a wild type of, player. and we'll do it for the pod, by the way, just to let everybody yeah, know we're doing of tons course. of tons of work. Once, you know, once Dude, I'm settled in next now. week, I, I was, yeah. I was in the middle of a, organizing a move and, and trying to like, I just moved in this week. So into All right, heavy day. draft content. I'm living in New week. York now, bro. Which is let's crazy, do it. Crazy, bro. Heavy draft content starting this next week. You heard it here on Big Blue, 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 Blue Banter. We're going to start that up next week. Some heavy stuff. We're diving full draft. But yeah, we're going to have fun doing those evaluations. But yeah, like I said, man, it's it's a good opportunity for the Giants. I think either at 47 or at six, both spots, there's going to be potentially BPA at that wide receiver position. All right, let's move on to our final need, the biggest need, number one. For us, Nick and I, it's the quarterback position. Um, I think if you look at the quarterback room as it stands right now, Tommy uh, Daniel Jones, Drew Locke, and Tommy DeVito, you can think of it whatever you want to think of it as a fan from that standpoint, but if you ask 31 general managers outside of the Giants organization, they tell you it's one of the worst rooms, if not the worst quarterback room. I was about to ask NFL. you that. Is it the worst quarterback room in the NFL? Well, that's a good question. Do the Giants have the worst quarterback room in the NFL? Um, obviously from this well, right podcast, now, right now, the Vikings, like, I mean, I would say it's Sam, better. Uh, Sam Donald, John Hall. Yeah. No, it's yeah, better it's than good. the Vikings. It's Daniel Jones Vikings. is better than Sam Donald. He's more proven. Yeah. So it's better than the Vikings. Um, but not by like a sustainable measure to me or anything like important, right? Like you can be and, slightly better, but it's not. And then really there, there are teams like the Colts who have Anthony Richardson. No, no, like, I'd rather, rather have that. Anthony Richardson. I'd rather have Flacco necessarily... Richardson in a heartbeat. Yeah, exactly. So there I are just teams. proved he could still play it in NFL. Level. No, yeah, but my point is though, there are teams that you're going to look at the names yeah. and roll your eyes or be like, "This guy's unproven." Daniel Jones is want to play and all this kind of stuff. But yeah. our point is, no one is going to jump and say, "Oh, the Giants have a really sound room in the quarterback." No, and I think it That's is definitely one of the worst, if not the worst, in the entire NFL. It's probably the third, second, third, or fourth worst quarterback room in the NFL. You can say the Raiders. That's possible. Uh, Gardner Minshew, Ada O'Connell. But I don't think that's that. I don't think Daniel Jones and Drew Locke and DeVito is that much better than that. I'm going to say, I'm going to say it is though. A little bit. Just, like just Gardner Minshew. I'll tell you this. You will. And that's fine. But Gardner Minshew has better stats across the board since he started. They, they came oh, I'm not saying Daniel Jones is better than Gardner Minshew necessarily, oh. but I think the combination of Drew Locke, Daniel Jones, and Tommy DeVito are better than Aiden O'Connell and Gardner Minshew. I don't think it's by a substantial amount. I think, by a little I, think bit, yeah. I think I think we're really just you know parsing we're splitting hairs. Right now, but, Point yeah. being, we don't need to get into every quarterback room right now. Point being, the Giants have, by most measures, by every GM except for you know maybe John Mara, or, you know, and some of the fans, <laughs> one of the worst quarterback rooms in the NFL, which makes it the biggest need by far for the Giants, especially when you add to the fact quarterback is by far and away the most important position in the NFL. You can debate that you're dead wrong. And I'm just going to move on past that. If you think that you're allowed to think your own opinion, you'll never convince me or any NFL GM or any NFL coach who all will tell you quarterback is quite clearly the most important position in the NFL. And it's not particularly close. So you got the most important position in the NFL. The giants are among the worst in the NFL. As far as quarterback room goes, according to the rest of the league, not maybe according to you. And that's fine. And in addition to those two things, you have a position of importance that Joe Shane has talked about. He, how important he feels it is to draft the players that get paid in the NFL quarterback. We know how much the market is for this position. It's insane to the point where Daniel Jones got 40 million a year and going up to 50 million next year or whatever it is against the cap because they push them back. So you've got all three things working there. All three factors, important position, uh, position get, that gets paid, and the Giants are weak in it. Now that's still, despite all of that, Nick, we still don't necessarily want them to take a quarterback in round one at six overall. And here's the reason why I tweeted about this the other day, and I want to get to your take after this, but I said this the other day, if the giants go quarterback in round one, Nick, the why has to be right. What do I mean by that? The why cannot be 
we take quarterback because our quarterback room looks like this and it's our biggest position of need. That can never be the why for using a sixth overall pick at quarterback because the opportunity cost at six overall is different than the opportunity cost at 47 or 70. It's massive. You're giving up a Malik Neighbors potentially type prospect. You're giving up a Romo Dunze type prospect. You're giving up a Joe Alt type prospect. One of the best tackles I've seen come out from a pure prospect standpoint in a long time. You're giving up all three Andy of Thomas those. Thomas is better. <laughs> Andrew Thomas was better, but Joe Alt was, in, in my opinion, is up there with Andrew Thomas when you consider not the Phoenix doesn't league. agree. I, I don't know if you hear that, yeah. but as far as the athletic profile goes for with with Joe Alt, he's the tenth most athletic yeah. offensive tackle in the history of the combine. In addition to having good tape, that to me says something potentially about his projection. But point being, you're giving up that, so the why cannot be we need a quarterback. Our room is so bad, we have to take the position because guess what. That's what happened in 2019. Dave Gettleman said, all right, I, th I looked at the Eli game in 2017 against the Eagles, and I got to tell you, this guy still got it. We're building for him. We're going all in. Barkley, cap this, cap that, Solder. Oh, crap, he said after 2018. Oh, never mind. I guess I was wrong about Eli and us being able to do this thing and compete for Super Bowls. I need to retire knowing I set this franchise right. By he said I would tire in and tuck it saying I got them a quarterback. So despite really only loving Justin Herbert, when Herbert didn't declare for that draft class in 2019, he went back to Oregon. Dave Gettleman went to work and he started reviewing the quarterback class. I would consider it to be late. He went down to the senior bowl, fell in love with Daniel Jones, and has admitted after that he went back and then after falling in love with him in the senior bowl, watch tape and loved it or whatever apparently so then you take daniel jones at six but you know those who do the evaluations of jones film most people that i trust including nick and myself but you don't have to trust us you can just look at had a second round grade on him at best he had a lot of issues he had the, like i said earlier in the last pod nick he had the 117th of all college quarterbacks in his final year at duke he was 117th in average depth of target he was a one read quick throw quarterback with slow eyes and slow processing at Duke who had all the physical tools that Dave loved, but the mental never got unlocked there. And it hasn't been unlocked since on the giants yet. Uh, you know, Dable found some solution for him, a short-term solution for him. Look, if you don't like your first read, do me a favor, Dan, come off the read and just run through the B gap. And for a while, teams were like rushing him to give up the B gap. Then they just said, uh, wait a second. Let's just pass rush him in a different way and take away the B gap. So now he no longer has that. As we saw last year, it led to Jones doing a lot of rollout rights, pocket collapses, and he just rolls all the way to the right, cuts off at the field, never keeps his eyes downfield, and dead play for the most part, or run for six to you know four to six to eight yards type of thing. Um, that that was the solutions there. So you know the the reason to me Nick cannot be that. It has to be we believe this guy can be a top five or top ten quarterback in the NFL. Why do I believe that so strongly, Nick? Because I believe that when you're making this pick, if you don't have that in mind, then where are you going with this? Because you know on that second contract, he's going to be eating up all your cap, 40 million against cap, 50 million against cap. But that rising salary cap could be 60 million against the cap. You have to understand when you make this pick that if this guy, if you're signing this guy, cannot just be, eh, maybe he'll be a top 15 guy that we can win with. No, 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 no. Because you cannot win with top 15 guys when they're making up $50 million of your salary cap space, in my opinion. So, to me, the why is super important for this need. It really just comes down to, do you think this guy can develop to be the top 15? Doesn't need to step right. in, right? right. Like Caleb Williams might step in and he might be that. He might. Drake May, Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy might not be. But do you think they have right. the ceiling? Are they coachable? How will they mesh with your vision, head coach of the offense? All of that all gets kind of grouped in. And I don't know if picking at six, the Giants are going to have the opportunity to select a guy that they believe will be that. I have no idea. Do they think JJ McCarthy right. is that? I have no idea. But if you do, you really must entertain it, possibly bring in, depending on the ceiling that you envision of this player and what he can do and what he has proven and what he, you think he can get to, essentially. So quarterback yeah. is always going to be the biggest need when, when you when you look at when you look at it. If you don't have one, if you don't have one for certain, you need to invest in the quarterback position. You can't just kind of sit on your hands and be like, oh, we'll work itself out. It's the quarterback's right. the most important position sports yeah and as long as the the why is correct i'm i'm interested in them drafting quarterbacks so if they believe that jj mccarthy can develop into one of the five ten best quarterbacks in the nfl i'm for it if they believe drake may can develop into one of the five ten best quarterbacks in the nfl i'm for it if they believe Jaden daniels can i'm for it but to me nick 
once you get past round one into into pick 47 and 70, that to me is when the wide changes a little bit. The wide is not the same for round yeah. one at six versus it is for 47 because the opportunity cost of 47 is just not quite the same. There's a lot of misses at the NFL level in the 40s. You're not getting a guarantee there at all. You're missing a lot in the 40s. You're missing a lot in the 70s. And that's why for investing at 47 is different. Yeah, you might miss on that quarterback. And I understand that the bust rates are incredibly high after the first round and the hit rates are incredibly low after first rounds in history of the NFL. You rarely find a quarterback of your future in the second or third round. But I think if there's going to be an outlier, Nick, maybe it's us. Maybe it's the team that has Brian Dable, who somehow got a lot of, you know, production out of Tommy DeVito for the most part, considering he didn't have any, you know, reps or anything. He just came in fresh, who turned a vertical passing game out of Tyrod Taylor, despite not having that much talent around it, who made Daniel Jones in 2022 look as good as he's ever looked in his career by far and figured out a system that works for Jones and who obviously developed Josh Allen. So I'm willing to maybe bet on an outlier with Brian Dable in here. And I'm willing, and, and especially when the opportunity cost goes down. So to me, the why definitely changes after you get out of the side of the first round. I'm right there with you, man. You have to uh, take a kick at the can as they say. And you might be able to find a competent quarterback. I mean, there have been competent quarterbacks who have been drafted now. They right. seem uninspiring, like the cars of the world and the Andy right. Daltons. But they were the faces of their franchise for the better half of a decade. And they had some playoff pushes now in terms of the Bengals. They never really won it. They just went and got spanked at home against a warm weather team like the Chargers that one year, which was just so bad and mind numbing. Right. That is a... a um. I don't know if risk is the right word, but that's an investment that that I can get behind if you believe that they have that potential as well and you're getting them at a discount. Sure. And you know what? With all those guys, and maybe if you had built, if you had a great GM and you'd built a, per, a much, a, not perfect, but an even better roster around those guys, they could have had more success. Car and Dalton. We don't know. We don't know how great those rosters were built around them. And maybe Josh Jane can do that. And then you don't need that. But, you know, it's definitely to me a different, different uh, discussion when you get outside around one. So just to wrap up here, our five biggest needs for the Giants heading into the draft. Number five, offensive guard. Number four, safety. Number three, cornerback number two wide receiver and number one quarterback. And that's it for the big blue banter podcast. Thanks a lot for listening. Drafts coming, coming soon. So we're going to get heavy into draft. Have a great rest of your weekend and we'll talk to you soon.